He was a calloused, hardened military man. Nothing seemed to move him. He certainly wasn't interested in any form of religion. He had been in many a battle. He had seen the shedding of blood. But one day, his whole life was changed. Welcome to the Master's Brush. I'm here in Nathan Green's art studio in southwestern Michigan, and we're looking at the impact of Christian art on our lives today. Nathan, what a delight to be with you in your studio again. Thank you. Welcome back today. I've really enjoyed dialoguing on your art and looking at its spiritual impact on our lives. It's really life-changing for so many people. I, yeah, I hope so. Nathan, the featured painting today is a painting we call the Centurion. Mm -hmm. Give me a little background of that painting. Well, you remember back at the time when Mel Gibson's movie came out, The Passion, and all the interest and uh, controversy even that was surrounding that movie. Um, during that time, I think there was a desire to create new artwork, and um, I was asked to create a new piece during that time to, you might say, capitalize on that interest. Um, and I, I wanted to create something a little different, though, than just another picture of Christ on the cross. I thought about the, the surrounding circumstances, and the, and the thought occurred to me, why not show something after the crucifixion, after everyone's left, the storm clouds are rolling away, and the officer is still there with his thoughts of what he's seen, what he's witnessed, and he notices the crown still sitting on the ground, blood on it and blood on the ground, and he leans down and picks it up as he's thinking about what he's seen. That's a real fascinating approach. The picture draws you in, and you're attracted to that Roman soldier. And I was particularly fascinated with his armor. How yes. authentic is that? Well, you know, this, the process for me took quite a while. I mean, uh, from the time that the movie was all being talked about and, and you know, all the excitement about it, so the time I finished this painting was about a half a year, and it's my fault actually because I got so carried away in, in authenticity. I started buying armor and various uh, you know, pieces that, for a costume and discovered, no, these aren't quite accurate, so I sold them and I bought others. And eventually I discovered that there are Roman Legion reenactment groups active, uh, one or two in the U United States, uh, about four or so in Europe, in England and in Germany. Uh, in fact, I discovered there is a leading authority on Roman armor in Germany. I called him several times, uh, fairly lengthy conversations, and uh, got the phone bill at the end of the month and discovered it was $600. <laughs> My wife was not pleased with me, but uh, I did glean a lot of accurate information, found out where the suppliers are for these reenactors, and purchased uh, custom-made armor from them. I was interested in the breastplate that the Roman centurion is wearing. It seems like there's little faces yes. in the circular portions of that breastplate, kind of like trading cards. What's that all about? Well, officers, centurions in particular, were responsible for a lot of men. And uh, they wore, they have on grave stellas uh, carvings of the officers, the centurions. They wore what they called phalere, which... Uh, they were medallions that represented different campaigns and different battles they participated in. Uh, the faces probably represented either Caesar, whoever was the commander in a particular battle. Uh, it was just a, a record of their participation. I'm interested in the spiritual implication of that. You know, as a theologian, I'm always looking for spiritual implications. Yes. And here's a Roman centurion mm -hmm. who has won battles that carries names and faces on his heart. Yeah. I think of Jesus Christ in heaven. Yeah. He has won the greatest battle on the cross with victory over Satan. Mm -hmm. And that Christ carries us on his heart, too. Yeah. Um, 
It must, this armor must have been very, very heavy. I think of the mail uh, that uh, the centurion draped over his body. What kind of weight are we talking about? Well, the one that I have is made out of steel. And now they did not have them steel then. They were usually bronze and uh, silver over them. They had a, a silvering process, so they looked silver. But, and they weighed about in the 30 pound range, 32, maybe 36 pounds. My steel uh, Hamada, chain mail Hamada they call it, weighs about 43 pounds, so it's a little heavier. Uh, when you add the, uh, the flare, the, all the, the sub armulus, the greaves, everything all together weighs in the 70, 75 pound range. Now I note here you have a jeweled case and yes. a small dagger. Yes. Would the centurion carry something like this as well? Yes, they would carry a sword and a dagger. The dagger was called a pugio. And, uh, you know, of course, again, a centurion uh, had 50 times the income of a regular legionnaire or Roman soldier. That's remarkable. Yes, so they were capable of buying much uh, fancier armor, uh, more ornate decorations on their belt and on their pugio case uh, sheath. Um, the helmets were much more intricate. A, a regular legionnaire wore what's called Lyrica Segmentata. It's plate armor that we usually think of a Roman soldier wearing. Uh, the uh, officer or the centurion could afford chain mail or plumata, which is scale armor. As I look at the centurion, of course, the major thing that he carries as a weapon is the sword. Yes. And uh, the case is quite ornately decorated, mm -hmm. and the sword has a sharper blade. I, I'm a little careful about this yeah. sword because I yeah. recognize that uh, I am not a skilled gladiator. Yes. Well, you can see when you're, when you're holding that, this is a, a Mainz gladius. I mean, they didn't call it Mainz back then, but a real one was found in Mainz, Germany. And so that design was named after that location. But that inward curve of the shape, um, when you hold that, that uh, sword, you feel how well balanced it is. You see the sharpness of it. I mean, these were very lethal weapons that they carried. When you painted this painting, what was the single foremost thing in your mind that you wanted to communicate? Well, this is to me a, a very powerful moment when everyone else has left and, uh, you know, the, the, the storm clouds that are in the background rolling away imply the, the storm and this huge event in world history is, is now calming down. And this military man, a career military man, who is a big, strong giant of a man, is realizing something powerful has happened here, and perhaps realizing his own need for what has happened here. He's in the midst of the greatest event in the history of the ages, mm -hmm. and something begins to dawn on his mind. Something begins to register in his consciousness. Yes. It's fascinating, Nathan, to me, to look at the difference in what Luke records that the centurion said and Matthew and Mark record what he said. Mm -hmm. In Luke chapter 23, Luke records the words of the centurion this way. As the centurion looks up at the cross and as he thinks about what's happened after Christ's death and as he reflects on it as you've captured in your painting, mm -hmm. Luke has the centurion saying in Luke chapter 23, verse 47, now when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Now that's fascinating to me. Many people will say, yes, Christ is a righteous man. Yeah. He's a good moral teacher. Mm -hmm. He's an ethical philosopher. He leads us to live a life that's pure, a life of integrity. Mm -hmm. They won't accept him as the son of God. Mm -hmm. They see Jesus just as a good teacher or a good example to follow. Yeah. If we only see Jesus as that, we miss the essence and the true meaning of the cross. Mm -hmm. The account of Matthew and Mark are a little bit different. They're not contradictory, but they're complementary. Mm -hmm. They take the centurion beyond saying Jesus is simply a righteous man, although he was that, but they add something else. And let me share with you what Matthew says about Jesus as Jesus is dying on the cross and what he has the centurion saying. Matthew chapter 27, verse 54. Now when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake, 
and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Yeah. So here, the centurion, the crowd, see Jesus, and they have that sense. Mm -hmm. He's more than a righteous man. Yes. He is the Son of God, mm -hmm. and that made all the difference for them. And my friend, that will make all the difference in your life. Understanding that on that cross that day, the divine Son of God tabernacled in human flesh, that Christ who had lived the perfect life was dying in your behalf, that the blood that was shed was shed for you as an atonement for your sins, that he truly is more than a righteous man. He's the Son of God. When we come back, after the break, we're going to explore that thought with Nathan even more. He was a powerful military man who commanded a garrison of 6,000 Roman soldiers. After witnessing what happened at the cross, he exclaimed, Truly, this was the Son of God. Get your framed 5x7 print of the painting, The Centurion, by Nathan Green, regularly $29.95 for the special price of $19.95 plus shipping and handling. You can order online at NathanGreen.com or call 760-723-8082 and ask for offer 124. Welcome back. Nathan, we're focusing today on the centurion. Mm -hmm. How do you find your models for these paintings? Well, that's a good question, and, and especially for this one. This was really an interesting story because I was looking for the perfect model for a big, strong Roman centurion, and it just happens that in our congregation, this man was just baptized, accepted Christ, and came in just when I was looking for someone like him. I needed a big, strong man who could handle the weight of all this armor. You know, I tried this armor on myself when I first got it all together, and for about five minutes, I was hurting. My, my shoulders were aching. It was too much. I didn't know how somebody could handle this, but he did it for about an hour while I did the photo shoot. Having just come to Christ, too, he had the joy of discovery on his face. Yes. This, this new convert in Christ and really represented the century He really well. did. It was perfect. It really was. Nathan... Um, Handling these swords, I picked up one of the swords and I was a little concerned they cut off my finger. Well, they are sharp, uh, very sharp. In fact, I had a youth group coming to my studio uh, to visit uh, after, when I was working. I was just finishing this painting and uh, I accidentally cut myself on one of these swords. I was trying to get them out of the way so they wouldn't be tempted to play with them. And uh, I was, as I was sitting there looking at the blood trickling down my finger and down my hand, the thought occurred to me, you know, I've painted blood on the foot of the cross here, on the crown of thorns and on the ground. It would have a little touch of authenticity, so I went over <laughs> and I dabbed real blood on there. So the original still has my blood on the painting. You know, the center of this painting is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Although he is not pictured in the painting, the center message of the painting is the blood that was shed by Jesus. Yes. And from the time that Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, down until the time that Christ died, the prophets looked forward, anticipated that moment yeah. when the atonement would be made, the substitutionary death for the sins of mankind. Dick Davidson, professor of Old Testament at yes. Andrews University, shares the significance of that death of Christ as predicted by the prophets. Let's look at what he has to say. Yes. Now, I'm an Old Testament teacher and so to answer that question, I have to start way back at Genesis 3, 15, where God gives the very first gospel promise, and he promises that the seed of the woman would, would crush the head of the serpent. We have there the first glimpse of the cross, the significance of, of, of the death of the Messiah to bring an end to evil, to, to bring the great controversy to a conclusion. And then as we move through the Old Testament, we find pieces added to this picture that's given in Genesis 3.15. We find a description of the substitutionary nature of Christ's death. In fact, it's already implied in Genesis 3.15 because he, the one seed, dies so that the rest of the seed doesn't. And you have the picture of, of, a, of a person taking off his sandal and stepping on the head of a poisonous viper there in Genesis 3.15, dying so that the rest of the people didn't have to die. And so Jesus dies a, a substitutionary death. And in Isaiah 53, this is enhanced to its, to its height as we see the suffering servant 
dying for the sake of sinners who couldn't pay for their own sins and Jesus dies as he bears the sins for us and so for me the heart of the meaning of the cross is the substitutionary atonement that is highlighted throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament there are other aspects of it that substitution that as Jesus takes the penalty of what we deserve and bears it himself that brings healing to us that brings peace to us that uh, is the means of destroying Satan and the devil and, and bringing a lie to his claims and as he is attacking the character of God. All these things that come as a result of this central meaning of the cross that Jesus died bearing the covenant curses that I deserve so that I can receive the covenant blessings that he deserved. It's the great exchange. It's the most wonderful news in the world. Jesus wore the crown of thorns so we can wear the crown of glory. Nathan, the central focal point of this picture is the centurion picking up the crown of thorns. Mm -hmm. What did you imagine the centurion thinking when he picked up the crown of thorns? Well, I think he probably was reviewing in his mind all the things he's witnessed, not just that day, but in the days and perhaps several years before. I'm sure he heard of Jesus. He may have even witnessed him uh, talking to crowds of people. He may have witnessed healings or heard about them. Um, and then that day, he may have witnessed and even overseen the flogging of Jesus and then the crucifixion and heard the words that he said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. And it is finished. And then he saw the, the earthquake and the strange happenings, the darkening of the sky. Uh, he knew something big was happening here. And he's trying to put it all together. The Holy Spirit was stirring his heart in remarkable ways. And as he looked at the cross, looked at the crown of thorns, there was a new dawning of spiritual awakening in his heart. In this painting, our eyes are drawn both to the crown of thorns, but beyond that, to the empty cross. Yes, right behind the centurion. There's one of the crosses shown behind is probably from one of the two thieves. But then directly next to him and above the shield, the Roman shield, is the foot of the cross that Jesus hung on. And it's empty. And that empty space right above where his feet were nailed and the blood trickling down uh, from when that occurred, that is the secondary focal point in my mind. I want people to look at this and think, uh, Jesus was there just, just before this, and this was where it all happened. The agony of the cross is beyond really human imagination. Dick Davids, an Old Testament scholar, professor at Andrews University, discusses for us the physical aspects of the death of Christ on the cross. Crucifixion was an awful death. It was the worst form of execution that one could imagine in Roman times and I dare say in modern times. It was reserved for the worst criminals to give them the most pain, the most anguish, the most suffering that it was possible for a human being to endure as they were dying. And archaeologists have actually uncovered crucified uh, corpses from the time of Jesus so that we have a picture of them in their contorted positions and uh, even their face still contorted up in pain. Uh, the pain was awful as the nails were, were pounded into the hands or the arms. Uh, the excruciating uh, anguish of, of dehydration, the crown of thorns upon their heads uh, with the loss of blood and so forth, and the long hours of standing there, uh, hanging there under the blazing sun. All of those were awful. But the worst part about the crucifixion experience was the inability to breathe. They all died of asphyxiation because their hands were outstretched and they had to pull themselves up with all of their efforts to try to get a breath. And finally, they wouldn't have any more strength to do that and they would succumb. Asphyxiation. So the, the physical pain was awful. But as we know in Jesus' case, that was just a small amount of the pain because he was dying of a broken heart. And so for all of that physical pain, it was scarcely felt in contrast to him dying, bearing the sins of the world. 
How can what Jesus did 2,000 years ago have an impact on our lives today? Right after the break, we're going to come back and look at the meaning of Christ's death on the cross 2,000 years ago for us personally today. Stay with us. The crowds had left, the day had ended, and the Roman centurion knew he had witnessed something remarkable at the cross of Jesus, something that forever changed his life. Why not order this remarkable 16 by 20 print of the centurion by Nathan Green for only $49.95 plus shipping and handling. Order today and you'll receive a free 8 by 10 print, $11.95 value of Nathan's painting, The Invitation. You can order online at NathanGreen.com or call 760-723-8082. Ask for offer 224. He was a powerful military man who commanded a garrison of 6,000 Roman soldiers. After witnessing what happened at the cross, he exclaimed, Truly, this was the Son of God. Get your framed 5x7 print of the painting, The Centurion, by Nathan Green, regularly $29.95 for the special price of $19.95 plus shipping and handling. You can order online at NathanGreen.com or call 760-723-8082 and ask for offer 124. Prophecies centuries old came to fulfillment that day that Christ was dying. Although the Roman centurion was not aware of it, he was part of a prophecy that was made a thousand years before. Let's go to the book of Psalms and read a prediction that the Holy Spirit inspired David to write down in Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verse 16 and 17, describes the crucifixion. The passage of Scripture says, For dogs have surrounded me, the assembly of the wicked has enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet, I count all my bones, they look and stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now this is an incredibly amazing prophecy. Here's why. The Jewish method of capital punishment was stoning. You remember when the woman was cast at the feet of Jesus, the woman who had committed adultery, the Jews wanted to stone her. It was not until the days of Antiochus Epiphanes, about 140, 50 years before Christ, that crucifixion was introduced. Crucifixion was practiced from about 150 years before Christ until Constantine did away with it in the early fourth century. So crucifixion was practiced by the Romans for that period of time. Certainly people were hung on trees. They were hung by ropes in the days of the Old Testament period, and also they were stoned. Isn't it quite amazing and quite remarkable that Psalm 22 makes a prediction about an event that would happen a thousand years in the future? Jesus would be crucified. His hands and feet would be pierced. His garments would be divided up exactly like Psalm 22 says. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 also describes this idea of crucifixion. Zechariah 12:10 says, And I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, that they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So again, they'll look on me whom they have pierced. The Roman centurion was fulfilling the prophecy of crucifixion. You see, Jesus is more than a good man. Jesus is more than an ethical philosopher. Jesus is more than a good moral teacher. Prophecies. Prophecies written in advance detail his birthplace. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says he would be born in Bethlehem. They detail that he'd be born of a virgin. Isaiah 7 verse 14 says a virgin shall conceive and give forth a son. His name shall be Emmanuel. They detail his ministry. Isaiah chapter 61 talks about the Messiah who would come and give joy for mourning. The Messiah that would come and forgive our sins and heal the sick. The prophecies that came to fulfillment in the last 24 hours of his life are remarkable. Zechariah talks about Judas betraying Jesus and selling him for 30 pieces of silver. 
The Bible talks about Christ's beard being plucked out and Christ being whipped on his back in the book of Isaiah. And here in the prophecies we've read, the Bible talks about Christ being crucified and pierced. And of course, in Psalm 16 and verse 10 and onward, it talks about Christ being resurrected from the dead. There is real substance to Christianity. We accept Jesus, not merely because we have a warm feeling in our hearts, not because some electrical impulse goes up and down our spine, not merely because there is some warm sentimental feeling in our life. We accept Jesus because he is the Messiah of prophecy, the one that the centuries looked forward to, the one that the prophets down through the ages predicted would come. This Christ that died on Calvary's cross was more than a good man, more than an ethical philosopher, more than a moral teacher. He was Jesus, the one that the prophecies foretold for centuries. He is your Christ, your Messiah. You can reach out and touch him and find forgiveness and grace and mercy. But the cross is empty, and Nathan has aptly painted it because Christ is risen from the dead. He is alive, and this living Christ wants to touch you. This living Christ wants to change your life. This living Christ wants to reach down into your heart like he reached into the Roman centurion's heart and make you a new man, a new woman. You can come as thousands have come and kneel at the foot of the cross and find Jesus, the same life-changing Lord, right now as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you are the life-changing Christ that just as the Roman centurion found you at the cross, we can find you at the cross. And just as his life was changed, our lives can be changed too. In Christ's name, amen.